I, I walked in here this morning and realised there's a very large stage, which makes me very happy because I can now walk around, but only if I have a tight line, of course. So, uh, so forgive me if I walk around a lot, I'm not very good at standing behind, behind the lectern. Uh, thank you for the introductions and, uh, and for Bob for uh, coming along as well and telling us a bit about uh, the university that, that we're at. Um, what I, when I was thinking about what, what to talk about today, it was obvious to me that the key issue that we face and something I've been thinking about for a few years is the issue of analytics and the relationship between OR, the OR society as well, and I think those two questions roll in together, and the area of analytics. And I'm sure many of you are very aware of, uh, of the growth of analytics, and I'll show you some data in a while about that, and the sense in which this is a subject that's uh, coming more and more to the fore. Indeed, um, that's Sue Merchant, ex-president of the OR society, even turned up this morning and said, oh, here's a, here's a eight-page supplement in a newspaper that's all about analytics. Thought you might like to read it. I haven't read it yet, I have to admit, because uh, I thought I'd better concentrate on this talk. But uh, I'll put it in my bag and we'll look at it later. So it's certainly a subject that is very, very much um, around. And what I want to do, really, is, is to think about this question, really, is, is what does analytics mean for OR, and what does it mean for the OR society? And I'm going to explore that uh, through looking at it in a number, a number of angles here today. First of all, really, is I'm going to tell you my own analytics story and where I first came across this idea and started to think about what it meant and its relationship to OR. And then we're going to try and answer the question of what is analytics. Uh, that can be interesting to discuss, but we'll, we'll have, a, have a look at it, look at some definitions, look at analytics in society, which in some ways the title of this talk sort of intimates about is how prevalent it is, and then really start to move into thinking about well, what does this mean about the relationship between OR, our own field, and analytics, and what does that imply for us as a, as a field, and how are we to progress OR alongside analytics. And yes, I am going to end by answering the question, should we change the name of the society to the Analytics Society? But I'm not going to tell you the answer until the end, so don't throw tomatoes at me yet. Uh, before, I, before I get into any of that, uh, I, just, I need to uh, do a few acknowledgements, first of all, to these uh, two gentlemen. Uh, Michael Waltonson, who is actually in the audience, I think, somewhere, um, and he decided he couldn't stand listening to me. Um, who's a doctoral student working with me and with Professor Neil Doherty, both at Loughborough University uh, in the School of Business and Economics there. Um, they've been working with me, uh, in fact, I have to say, acknowledging primarily goes to Michael here, who's been doing the work, um, really looking at it's uh, funded by the OR Society, which is my third acknowledgement through a charitable project, where we've been looking at this relationship between OR and analytics, and to be honest, a number of the ideas I'm presenting today have come from Michael's work, uh, so I need to give you acknowledgement to him. One thing you will realise already that if you do decide to explore this subject is that your follicle, follicles will be seriously challenged, none of us have very much hair left. Uh, I promise you it's not the result of this, um, of this project. Um, I will also, just a quick advert for Michael, he's running one of the workshops tomorrow as well, on uh, analytics and OR at the Make an Impact Day. So there's an opportunity to, to hear first hand rather than second hand from me some of these, some of these ideas. Okay, I want to go back to, uh, to 2007. And um, my memory may not be correct, but I think, um, I, think I, I placed this conversation that took place in the car park with uh, my dean at the time, who was at uh, Warwick Business School, Howard Thomas. Um, just before I, I go into what that conversation was, uh, at the time I was um, Associate Dean for the Master's programmes at Warwick Business School. I was looking after 10 Master's programmes. Um, we were turning into sort of seven, eight million pounds a year with sort of five or 600 students. And one of those 10 programmes that I was looking after was the uh, Masters in Operational Research and, uh, and Management Science. And I was in quite an interesting position as a professor of OR because probably the, the 
the weakest program in that portfolio was gradually becoming the OR Masters. And in fact, we were getting to a point where I was going to have to make a decision to shut the program, the program down because we were running into, into a loss-making position. And that was quite awkward for me is to explain to my own colleagues that I'm about to shut down my own program effectively. In fact, one of the main reasons I originally went to the, uh, the business school at Warwick was to be part of and involved with that master's program. So this sort of led to, as I say, what I think was a conversation in the car park uh, at the business school, that's just a random car park I've got a picture of up there. It's not, it's not a random picture of, but that is Howard Thomas, I promise you. It's some bloke I found on the internet. And uh, this is about 2006 7. He said, If I were you, Stuart, I would have a look at Tom Davenport's book on competing on analytics uh, and start to think about uh, you know, that relationship with OR. So I took his advice, I bought a copy of the book. I've just remembered what I was going to read from when I left it in my bag, so I shall quickly whip it out. Put my head in there. <laughs> and uh, I started to read through this book, and uh, my first observation was well, according to me, actually, it never mentions the word operational research in it. Michael has, I think, tested this out for me, he reckons the term operations research does appear twice in the whole book. But you start to read some of the methods and uh, approaches that he starts talking about in here, and we get terms like combinatorial optimization, experimental design, Monte Carlo simulation, neural network analysis, yield analysis, let me just uh, pick out some others, uh, location analysis, uh, capacity planning, modeling, routing, scheduling, and this is what this book is all about. So I sort of got over my annoyance that it isn't a book about operational research, but it's just basically retitled operational research. And so I to think, well, hold on a minute, there seems to be quite a lot of interest in this area, so maybe we should explore this idea a little further. So we then went through a process of thinking about what we did with the Masters in Operational Research at the Business School. It wasn't without controversy, and I have to say it ended up with me in sort of playing fairly a hard line with it, and actually having to go around every single member of the OR group and interview them individually to get their understanding of what they thought, dealing with opposition in some cases uh, to this idea of should we really launch a completely different masters as such in analytics. Where we ended up was in September 2009, was launching a program in business analytics and consulting, which was actually, in truth, just the OR Masters with a slightly one change module and a rename, renaming <coughs> to it. And we ran alongside it the original OR Masters. Now, if I say we went from having what would have been 35 to 40 students on the one program to having 100 students across the two programs straight away, and that was only on a six-month run-in of advertising. And then the next year we repeated the same again. Then it showed immediately to me that there was a huge interest in this topic and a real opportunity for OR to effectively market itself through the title of analytics. So what is analytics? Well, Perhaps the best way I can define that is, is to you borrow a couple of definitions. In fact, first of all, up on the screen, on the screen there, is uh, the one that Davenport uses in the book, um, and it, it describes it as this: extensive use of data, statistics, and quantitative analysis, explanatory and predictive models, and fact-based management to drive decisions and actions. The analytics may be input for human decisions or may drive fully automated decisions. And I don't see, and we'll look at that a little bit more in a while, I don't feel uncomfortable as an OR person pretty much saying that is what OR does. And uh, a more recent definition, which informs uh, American OR societies now using, is expressing it as a scientific process of transforming data into insight and making better decisions. It's slightly more succinct. Uh, definition of very much the same idea. Basically taking data, analysing it, 
and making decisions, either helping people make decisions or automating decision making using, uh, using that data and those approaches. An alternative way of looking at uh, app analytics, and this actually has largely appeared in the, in the OR world, is to think about what's the purpose of analytics. And many of you will have seen this sort of definition of descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. I find this quite interesting because I look back at um, my, uh, I, one of the things I did at Warwick was, was look at the, the way we taught MBA students about OR. And going back to the late 1990s, and I pick out my notes for, uh, in fact, the introductory lecture to that, which is called Why Managers Use Models. And one of the things I did was explain that there's four types of models that we use uh, for managers. There are descriptive models, there are predictive models, and then there are two other types, optimizing and experimental. Now that was before the word analytics had been invented, and yet interestingly, from a very OR perspective, using very similar definitions. Now, I think this is quite nice in terms of explaining what sort of a, a purposes there are for analytics and the way that it's used. Where I start feeling less comfortable is where people then start associating particular modelling techniques against these titles. So I, you will see things, for example, that optimization methods are descriptive analytics, and indeed I go to my own home field, which is simulation, Simulation is normally described as pres pres prescriptive analytics, with which I largely disagree. In fact, if you take that as an example, I would argue that simulation can be used in a descriptive form to help people think about the world more. Simulation can be used in a predictive form to think about what might happen next. And actually, it's rarely used in a prescriptive form to actually prescribe action Though occasionally, particularly if we link an optimization engine with it, we might use it in that context. So my contention would be actually this is not about techniques, this is about the purpose of analytics, and that probably you could fit any technique at different levels of magnitude into each of the three categories. And I think that's a better way of thinking around this. So, so far, we're saying, well, it doesn't seem to be far removed from our OR world. So, what is actually different about this world of analytics? Why, why are we making any fuss about it? Is it really just rebadged OR? Well, I think that it's clear in Gavin Paul and Harris's book, and that's really the premise of what they're writing about, is the difference is simply this, is that word, big data. And the whole premise of, of their book is... We live in a world now with lots and lots of data. Really, managers in organisations ought to be doing something with that data. So what is big data? Well, it's not just about having lots of data, which we refer to as the volume of data now available. And the next slide will say a bit more. And I'll trot out some the usual sorts of figures on how much data there is today. But it's also referring to the velocity, the speed with which data is now delivered to us, of course, in real time in many cases. I'll, I'll generate that, show you an example of that in a moment. And also about the variety of data that's now available to us. We're not just talking about numbers, we're talking about text, we're talking about uh, video, social media, and so on and so forth. And that all of this means we have to adapt the way that we think about it. Um, analysis and how we do it. We're living in a world where there is an awful lot of data and you know, it's very fast in many, many different forms. So, uh, I, I just picked this out. It's like the old statistic, but I quite like just the way it was um, presented. So, the International Data Corporation, going back to 2011, so the world will have moved on a lot since then, is saying that uh, by then we created 1.8 zettabytes, whatever that is, or 1.8 trillion gigabytes, I quite like the way it's then presented, which is, uh, that's enough to fill 57.5 billion 32 gigabyte iPads, which means that everybody in the world has to own uh, something like 10 iPads in order for us to hold all that data. 
Um, that is the amount of data that's around in the world. And if you look at the rate at which it's coming at us, we see things such as um, more than two, uh, every minute, more than 204 million email messages are being created, over 2 million Google search queries, 48 hours of new YouTube videos are being created, a variety of data notice, um, all this stuff being stuck up on Facebook, and 100,000 more tweets are being put up, and uh, as we've already announced, we'd like that to go up during this conference, we do more tweets as well, I have to add myself into that category, I must tweet while I'm here. Uh, the truth is, I only tweet once a year, and that's when I'm at this conference, and that's because uh, my colleagues at the OR Society remind me that I must tweet. <laughs> now, this is quite interesting to me, because uh, I studied um, OR originally back in the uh, early 1980s, and uh, one thing that my lecturers always sort of uh, put across to me was the issue that when you get to real organisations, data is going to be a real issue for you. They're not going to have it. Of course, you never believe them, and then you get a proper job, and you go out there and you do some consulting work and so on, and you discover that actually nobody has any data. And, uh, of course, the great holy grail of, of those days was if I could get 30 data points, <coughs> then I can use the central limit theorem and assume normality, and that will solve all my problems. The world is very different. And, and I think one of my worries is that a lot of us, I include myself in this, is still working in a world where we hope to get 30 data points. And we hope that we might be able to assume normality, whereas the world actually has an awful lot of data in it now. And I think that has real implications for the way that we practice modelling and OR. Okay. So, I'm sort of talking about the trotting out figures. Let's look at a couple of examples of analytics. Um, many of you, I'm going to try and I've got a video, I think, that might run. I'm playing to use it, which I'm hoping has been turned out a bit, otherwise I can't talk while it's playing. But many of you will. Um, let's see if we can get this to work. Many of you will have come across uh, or heard of Street Bump, but primarily actually because of its. Um, application in, uh, in the Boston area. Uh, here we go, let's just set this running. Let's see, it plays in play. Plays in good dance while we play the music. But... <laughs> there we go. Um, this is just a little 50 kind of second advertising video. But the idea is that you use your, uh, your smartphone, which you place on the, uh, on the, in the car, to record any movement as the car moves along, that uh, through this, they're collecting data, here we go, um, being analysed, identifying where there are potholes in the road, and he comes along and checks it, and um, oh yeah, here we go, they fill it in for you, and uh, uh, problem solved. Do is they bring it to your city and it's being applied in a number of different, uh, different places. The main uh, sort of controversy that's, uh, that's come around that, of course, is that actually, of course, it favours uh, areas where richer people live um, simply because they can afford smartphones and uh, therefore potholes tend to get. Um, tend to get filled in, in, uh, in middle class areas of, of America, of Boston, but not in, in the poorer districts, where actually there's probably more, uh, more potholes. I mean, the other, the other two questions I raise is, what happens if you drop your phone while you're driving? Do they assume there's a very big hole? I assume they want a number of samples before they decide to go and look. And the other question I really have is, what are these drivers doing falling down potholes? Because my every intuition is to drive around one. Not to actually fall, fall down it. So, uh, yes, would they really ever detect a large pothole? Probably not, because people, I assume, wouldn't actually try and drive down a large pothole. Um, second example, this is, you probably can't read this too well. This is, this is uh, an email I got a few months ago now from Booking.com. I had to scratch my head in time and think, when did I ever book anything with Booking.com? But 
thing I had, and they did actually remember in the end what I put. Anyway, they, they, uh, they tell me this, they say our travel scientists are at it again. Now they are trying to predict where you'll go for your next trip. So predictive analytics in action here. They've analysed your past destinations, scrutinised what those places are endorsed for, cooked it all up in a booking.com test tube, and they've come up with, by this point I'm getting really excited, where am I going to go next? And what am I going to do? And they came up with shopping. <laughs> Thank you. 
many of you would recognize that a lot of our work actually is done in spreadsheets with fairly simple analysis. You can just draw into graphs sometimes helps. So to me, actually, I, I would put that at least in brackets to say, yes, sometimes we're very advanced, but sometimes actually we use some fairly basic methods to help illuminate a decision situation. But by the way, the important thing is that OR is about using analytical methods to help make better decisions. And how does that compare to, say, that important Harris's definition, which is the extensive use of data, etc., etc., uh, analysis and fact-based management to drive decisions and act actions? Well, we have a very long debate, perhaps, about semantics of that, but to me, there is a very clear, approximate similarity between those two definitions. So in many ways, we're talking about coming from the same world. Now we can have a very long debate about OR versus analytics, and in fact, you know, going back over the years, I can see we had debates about OR versus um, decision support systems, or management information systems, or business intelligence, or even business process re-engineering. Do note that business process re-engineering was also that important <laughs> a key figure in that. He's very good at adapting himself. Something we'll come to in a while. So we certainly, I think, say that we have a shared concern between OR and analytics, which is to use data, to use analysis to help make better decisions. That is our shared concern. We also, we would say, have a shared approach to what we do. Let's start to think about that. Is that both in OR and in analytics, we're using technology, primarily computing technology, that with that we're bringing in quantitative methods into that world, and we're using them to make decisions. And in fact, a little bit more than just making decisions, we're actually helping to think about how we make decisions better, that actually as a topic in its own right. So you ask me what is soft OR about? It fits largely into this sort of category here. It's about making decisions. It's not primarily about technology or quantitative methods. So it's not just an outcome decision making, but it's a process and a discipline in its own right. So we see OR and analytics having this shared approach using technology, using quantitative methods, and driving decision-making out of it. Now then we start to think well about the relationship, and um, some particularly Michael's helped illuminate through, through the project, is to think back a little bit through history. So, a quick think around the shared history of our and analytics, which I've highlighted on this slide. And what we're thinking here is it's pretty much like a, a three-strand rope. You go through history, three strands being technology, quantitative methods, and decision making. So examples would be, we think around the uh, technological aspect, we might be going back to the early 1900s, when primarily technology was driven by manufacturing technology, new technologies, allowing mass production at the time, Henry Ford and all that sort of thing, uh, enabled us to move, move into mass production. But that gradually, and as we move towards and through the Second World War, started to move into particularly an emphasis on computing technology, when first computers were appearing in the 40s and 50s, where we started seeing that becoming much more course, widespread into the 60s, and eventually moving to the personal computer, and of course much more recently, uh, the, the real personal computer, which is even your smartphone, are all developments in technology that we see running through time. Quantitative methods, we perhaps go back to the invention of things such as uh, statistical process control. Back in the 20s, uh, Schubert's work at that time, through into the war period where we see particularly operational research coming into the fore. At that time, we see in the 50s and 60s, or let's go back to the 40s, particularly linear programming, 50s and 60s, computer simulation. Um, and so on, through time, we see the development of new quantitative methods. And intertwined with that is the interest in decision making, which perhaps was driven initially from very much a psychological perspective. So we see things like the Stout School, which drove a lot of thinking about 
about decision making um, and how people make decisions. You know, who worked with Herb Simon in the 50s. We moved through to the development of soft OR in the 70s and 80s, and so on. Uh, behavioral science is very much even now, uh, particularly coming to the fore earlier than that, we were particularly looking at behavioral marketing. But these are all intertwined elements of technology, quantitative methods, and decision making that wrap through time. And what we started to see is actually over time, we've described this approach in different ways. So we might go back to the early 1900s and 1910s and we were talking about scientific management, like the Henry Ford, the Taylorist approach to uh, managing, particularly manufacturing. Developed into the idea of the scientific method. And we might even say it moved into being actually called for a while operational research as we came out of the war period and uh, the idea is spreading to industry. We see a period where we talked primarily about management information systems, decision support systems, business intelligence, and we happen today to be talking about analytics. What will we be talking about next? Maybe even data science is the word that's already starting to perhaps be used more than analytics is. We don't know what's coming next. Just as an aside, before I say a little more about this, um, why do you think you start to view this in terms of uh, the way that operational research builds up? And then we move through to Akos' famous uh, talk in the same forum, The Future of OR is Past at the End of the 70s. And I think what he was identifying was the end of this era, such as, as OR perhaps being seen as a prime mover within this three strand growth. We moved into management information systems, decision support systems, and so on, starting to take the forefront. But it didn't mean that OR is dead. Well, I hope not, because there's quite a lot of us here, uh, and you seem to be breathing, so we can assume we're still alive. Now, as we thought about this more, we started talking about paradigm shifts. We started saying, well, there was a paradigm of scientific management, and it shifted into a paradigm of uh, scientific method, and so on and so forth. And then we thought, that's just not right. If you look at the idea of Kuhn's paradigm shifts, they are a complete departure from what came before. And that isn't what's happening here. We're talking about eras where a single paradigm seems to move forward into a new era. And perhaps what causes that shift is a shift in one of the areas in technology, in decision making, or in quantitative methods. So we might argue that the move into operational research was a shift in quantitative methods and their use. The movement into managing information systems was a shift in technology, much more widespread technology. The shift into analytics is the availability of very large quantities of data that are becoming at its vast speeds and its vast variety. So, what we think is, we have here a single paradigm. Let us run through history, certainly back to the early 1900s and, and probably uh, before that. So that then leads to the problem, what do you call this paradigm? So we set Michael off with a dictionary, we go away and have a look, he came back with some things, you know, nah, I don't like that, I don't like that. Um, mostly because actually if you start using scientific management or something, all loaded terms that have been used before. And then he came up with this wonderful word that none of us can actually say, called Diane, yeah, I can't say, Dianoetic. Okay? And I said, I like that word, not because I can't say it, but I like that word because nobody knows really what it means. Uh, perhaps I can take a poll here, I guess there are a few who uh, are walking dictionaries and know that word already. Um, but actually, it has no sort of history of use. So let's refer to this as the dianetic, dianoetic management paradigm. I will try and say it properly. What does this term mean? Um, when you look it up in the dictionary, it refers to it as of or related to thought, especially to discursive reasoning rather than intuition. So it's really about saying using reasoning for making decisions. 
decisions rather than using just purely intuition. Now this is not to decry the use of intuition within decision making, but to say the emphasis of technology and quantitative methods and decision making together is to use an evidence-based approach to making decisions to reason our way through decision making. And so we end up with what we think is probably a paradigm. You know, I'll argue about that at great length, but I suppose we're academics, so we like to put our names to things. That might in greater sort of detail and thinking about what are the disciplines that contribute to this paradigm look like this. So the underlying disciplines behind technology probably the areas of electrical engineering and computer science. The underlying disciplines behind quantitative methods, the math stats, and the more mathematical end of economics. Decision making is around psychology and behavioral science. And then we get these disciplines that sit at the interface between two areas. Artificial intelligence might be about a mix of machine learning quantitative methods and technology. The information system sits here at the interface between technology and decision making. And last but not least, our own home base here, operational research, sits at the interface between quantitative methods and decision making. So yes, we're working in this area, developing and using quantitative methods, but we're also thinking around decision making hence soft OR, and hence also behavioural OR, something that we'll discuss in more detail later today. And the paradigm together, at this point in time, is called analytics. And I find this really quite illuminating about thinking, where do we sit as OR people? And it says to me, we don't cover all of analytics, and I don't think we ever want to. Primarily because we're not really working in this area. Yes, we use technology, but we're not really about developing technology. We'll leave that to the computer scientists. Uh, they, they give us the technology that helps us move forward. And so I suppose what I would refer to as as doing is we are at the forefront and in the centre of what I might describe as decision analytics which is actually saying, I've got the data, I've got the technology, I'm now going to use it to help people make decisions. And that is very close to what OR has always been about. So what does this mean for OR? The second thing is to say, again, shamelessly stolen from Michael's work, um, is to think about this analytics or this dianoetic paradigm as an ecosystem. And we're just a part of that. So what we have up here is a set of disciplines of which our management science is one that has its own customer base. People who would say, oh, I'm going to go to an OR person and get this done. But down here we have a whole set of disciplines or the wider paradigm all of these contribute to this wider paradigm, and the point is that this has many more customers associated with it. And the strength that we gain being part of this ecosystem is because we feed off the other disciplines that coalesce with us within this ecosystem, and by plugging into the wider ecosystem, we gain many more customers. So what we don't, what we want to do is to plug in this wider ecosystem, which at present is the dianetic management paradigm, is analytics. So if we agree with this view, what should we do? Well, one extreme <coughs> is to say, I really don't like all this stuff. I don't like this analytics talk or whatever it's going to be called next. And OR is just OR. That's what we do. Place my Hold in the sand, sit on my little desert island, and isolate myself from the rest of the ecosystem, from the rest of the paradigm. And it's very much saying I'm going to focus on my own customers, 
whoever they may be, I'm going to develop my own methods for those customers, and I'm not going to think about the wider world. We call that an isolationist approach. The other extreme approach, and I gather I'm not going to agree with either of these, is what we might call the faddist type approach. It's sheep running after something here. It's going to be running very fast, but uh, uh, is actually let's abandon OR completely. Forget the term, call ourselves analytics, and just plug it completely into the wider ecosystem. Why would that be dangerous? But primarily because what we see through history is that the paradigm moves on. And so within a few years, analytics may no longer actually be called analytics. Dynamic management paradigm may have moved to another title. And therefore it's quite dangerous to associate yourself purely within, uh, with the paradigm and what it's called at a point in time. The other reason it's dangerous for us is that, as we've seen, OR is not all of analytics. It does not really cover the technology area. So what we want is some kind of middle ground, which I would propose would look something like this. Is that we actually celebrate the fact that OR remains as a discipline. It's been around since the 1930s. It has its own customers. It has its own identity that we actually celebrate that fact and say, yeah, you know, we are a part of this wider diametric management paradigm. We're all going to have to have elocution lessons on how to say that. Mm. Um, so actually, if we keep plugging into that paradigm, recognise our place within it, and actually work with the other disciplines, then actually we can be very strong and we can even grow and gain customers as people see our role, which is particularly about helping people use analytical methods to make decisions within that area. But to do that, we have to adapt with the ecosystem. And the primary element of that adaptation at the moment is that we must adapt to big data. We'll say a little bit more on that as I close in, in a few minutes. So it's about adapting to survive. So, the final part really is to just say a little bit about how I see that OR has progressed alongside this um, new era of analytics. Bear in mind, I think the first use of the word was about 2002, it started coming to the fore in really, Davenport's book in about 2006 7. Uh, so, we've been around for towards 10 years now, and certainly high up in people's thinking for the last five, five or six years. Let's look at this from three perspectives, the practitioner perspective, the academic perspective, and finally from the OR Society's perspective, which is where I want to close. Uh, this is, uh, I, I managed to, uh, to hack into, no, I didn't hack into, I uh, was allowed into the, uh, the HORF, uh, heads of our forum website. Uh, this is a quick look through at what uh, members of the heads of our forum, who are the leaders of our practice, uh, are calling themselves these days, or are calling their teams. And what you will see, without me reading out all of these titles, is a strong use of the word analysis or analytics in their titles. And there's certainly very clearly that in OR practice, there's been a real move to using the word um, analytics in the title. There are still some groups. Um, that uh, call themselves OR and seem, that seems to work within their organisation. But in many cases, people are now using the term analytics. And I think, you know, I was saying earlier, is it dangerous to change our title? But it may be dangerous to change the title of discipline. I don't think it's such a problem to change the name of a group or a job, because actually that can be changed again very quickly as the paradigm moves on. So maybe in five years' time, all these people will be calling themselves data scientists or something similar um, because analytics has outgrown its usefulness as a term. And it's relatively easy to change that. But I do have a question with this change as to what extent has practice adapted 
to the world of big data? Or is there a danger that it's just a retitling without really a true adaptation to the new world that we're in? From a, an academic perspective, um, this is the slide, it's quite dangerous because I'm bound to have forgotten somebody here. Um, but looking at, uh, at the UK, I think I've covered Ireland, yes, I've got Ireland in there as well, for the Dublin Institute of Technology. All of these universities now are running analytics courses, either at undergraduate or postgraduate level, or are in the process of about to launch or launching. The originals in the UK were so too fat the Warwick one, as I've mentioned. In fact, um, we, well, as far as I can tell, that was the, the, I thought it was the first in the world. And unfortunately, I discovered that Chicago launched a um, analytics course in March, I think, of the same year, which beat the Warwick course. So, okay, first or second, and in fact, Dublin Institute of Technology also launched an analytics masters in 2009 uh, at the same time. Um, interestingly, the Irish of our society has just renamed itself the Analytics Society. Um, we see a lot of courses. Many of these are run by our departments, but know that many are actually also run by computing departments uh, as well, some of the mathematics involved. So it's quite a move in that direction. I wonder with the OR courses and what we're trying to check with the project is to what extent are they just rebadged OR courses or are they really analytics courses? Are they really interested in big data? What about research then? That's a little bit more against participation if I can get it here. Now, at the end of 2013, how many articles could we find in the International Abstracts and LRs, this isn't just in the year 2013, this is through the whole history of the International Abstracts and LR. How many articles could we find in the International Abstracts and LR of all OR journals that had either analytics in the title or analytics in the abstract? Give me a number. Ten. ten. <coughs> Anybody want to go up from ten? Twenty. Fifty. Five. 500. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say the latter number, <laughs> um, because actually the earlier numbers were around about right 23. And uh, I have to add that actually eight of those were published in interfaces were actually practitioner papers. So that means we can only find 15 papers, at most, academic papers about analytics up to the end of 2013. So, at this point, I really question, what are the academics doing? Because I think there is a real danger, and I'll count myself with this, though I'm telling you, we just published a paper with analytics in the title, right? Mm. I'm all right. Um, but, you know, this has been around for 10 years. It's at the forefront of many people's minds. It's all over the press. It's everywhere. And surely academics are meant to lead. And yeah, I wonder if in OR we're taking something of an isolationist approach and saying, no, we are OR and we don't link into this. And I really think we have to think about what we're doing with big data and OR. Um, okay. It doesn't give a whole picture. I'm sure there are papers in other journals written by OR people that about analytics, and there are probably papers that effectively about analytics that just don't happen to use the term. So it may not be quite as bad. But I find that quite a telling thing. Sure. Can I ask a question? You may ask a quick question, yes. Yeah. How many of those papers have the term operational research? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, come to the point, that's Mike tomorrow, right? He'll tell you, he's in Indian houses. Finally, from the academic point of view, then I think we have to ask the question, where is the research in OR on leveraging big volumes of data, utilising new data architectures? Who knows anything about Hadoop? I know the word, I don't really know much about it. 
incorporating unstructured data in our models, streaming data in real-time analytics, visualizing data. These are all areas that analytics is interested in and which I think OR has a real part to play. We have a history of over 70 years of doing this sort of stuff with small data. All we've got to do is adapt to big data. And I think we also have to ask the question, what is the new OR methodology? To say, my methodology lectures were all about having, if I am lucky, 30 data points. We may actually be moving to a world where we have to think quite differently. It's not, oh, I'm lucky if I get some data, but I've got lots of data. How best do I manage that to come up with sensible conclusions? So finally, just three slides thinking about the society's response to all of this. Well, we've already started to some extent along that road. You'll see if you look at uh, inside OR on the front, it says OR at the heart of analytics. It's also on the website. We have the analytics network. If you haven't seen anything about it, there's the web address uh, up there, um, which is basically a super sick, a super special interest group uh, that focuses on analytics. We have the annual conference, one day conference, excellent event. We get 150 people, we get 150 people at that including actually people from outside of our standard OR sphere. Uh, we run training on analytics. We have uh, a publication called Analytics Quarterly. So we're doing a number of things to highlight the fact that OR links with the analytics world. But if we look at what the Americans are doing, they've gone a lot further than we have. You might argue that they've gone too far. But uh, some of you may have seen the analytics magazine, which actually is largely just rehashed content, but in a really nice magazine format. Uh, online, it's free, so you can just get hold of it. That is about analytics and OR with analytics. Uh, they have conferences, uh, they renamed their practitioner conference to uh, business analytics and operations research. <coughs> this year, they ran a big data conference. Uh, they run continuing education in analytics, so it's the same as we do with the training course. You can go in and you can find out how mature you are. Uh, that's with respect to analytics. You, uh, there's a survey you can fill in uh, as an organisation. You can see where you are on your, as they would call it, analytics journey. And they have the uh, certified analytics professional qualification, which is about people who aren't necessarily members of the informs coming along, taking an exam, demonstrating they have analytic skills which then they can take out to the marketplace and say I'm actually a certified analytic professional, big fat job market and what that might do for So, okay, that's the response that informers have made and uh, I think it's interesting to look at that. I think we have a very different market to them. So I think there are elements of what they've done that are really good. I think there are question marks as well about some of the things they've done. So in closing, how far should we go? Well, thinking about this, I went as far as actually designing our new logo. The analytics, I don't really like that. I need to from Google, actually. But, uh, the analytics society, there you go. That's what it should be like, isn't it? So should we go as far as simply abandoning our name and calling ourselves the Analytics Society? Well, my argument is no. Okay? Say to me getting tomatoes in front of me, I think. Because I would see that as dangerously faddist. The like those sheep, just following along. And of course, in five, ten years' time, when analytics is no more, where are we going to be? So, should we just say it's the OR society? Um, the danger of that. Practitioners, many of them now call themselves analytics people. 
I have a feeling that, you know, given the choice as a, a young person starting in the job market, doing analytical type of work, I would be more attracted to the analytics society than to the OR society. So we really do have to think about that and have a concern. So I do think the approach we should take, it is very much going back to the earlier slides I was showing, is really neither of these extremes. I would argue we keep our name. We are the OR society. That is our discipline. That is the area that we represent. But we need to be like a comedian. We need to adapt. Now, I, I could get into a discussion here and try and come up with uh, lots of adaptations we can make. I've shown you some we've already made. I've shown you the adaptations that Informs has made. I want to leave that as something to debate and discuss. And I hope that out of this there will be a much more in-depth discussion about how we take this forward. But to me it is clear it is imperative for us to provide more analytic services to reach out to that wider ecosystem. If we only feed ourselves in OR, we will eventually die because we separate ourselves, we isolate ourselves from the wider ecosystem that, as you see, is much larger and is thriving. But it doesn't mean we abandon our roots if we don't say that OR has this contribution to make is simply that we have to provide more services. And we must, and we must communicate what we are outside of the our society membership. The danger again is if we only talk to ourselves, we will eventually die because we're not linking in with the wider world. And the big question is, how do we achieve that? I'll finish with on final advert, um, talked about the work that Michael, Neil, and myself have done. It's just, I uh, have got the proof this morning um, for article in the European Journal of Operational Research. Uh, there it is, so it should be online. In fact, the word version is already online, I think. It should be online in the next couple of weeks, and uh, we paid for that open access thing. So uh, you can all get it for free. Um, so do please look, and it gives you a lot more detail.
think that that's the important thing to get out there, but it also we need as our people, as a society, to communicate with that world much more widely. And that is both to practitioners and to academics. Uh, I'm very aware at the moment that there's um, calls out for something called the Turing Institute, which is a huge investment in big data capability. And that's being led at a number of universities by computer scientists and mathematicians. We've tried at our own university. We've just advertised 10 posts to support that area. Um, we, that's uh, other parts of our university, but we have at least got somebody from our R group who's on the committee who's discussing this, so we're trying to make sure we communicate it. So it's just primarily about people. Uh, linking to uh, the wider world, um, I think certainly it's useful to link with informs, which has done a lot in this area. I don't detect that Euro and i are quite so far along the road, and maybe we need to be more of an influence on them. I mean, they are, a lot of those societies are primarily academically driven rather than practitioner driven. It does make some difference. We have an ultimate chance next year, a big face to face meeting when Euro comes to, I can say to the UK, but maybe I don't want to be in the <laughs> so I may need a visa by then to go to our home conference. <laughs> Thank you. 